Good morning. This week on The Word with Adele, we're going to be looking at the kingdom of God. We're going to continue our study on what we started last week, um, or actually a couple weeks ago. And we're going to be looking this morning on the most integral part of the, and the most important part of the kingdom of God. So come back. It'll be a tremendous blessing to you. so much again for joining me this week and as I said before we've been looking at the kingdom of God and why is the kingdom of God so important why is it important that I know about it well if you're a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ if you're a born-again believer then the Word of God says that the kingdom of God has come to live and dwell within you so you need to know what's in you it's important that you know that and until you know about the kingdom of God functioning, how it functions, how it works, and what makes up the kingdom, you're in ignorance and you're in darkness, and therefore there'll be no blessings and you'll not be able to live victoriously as well as, as effectively in the kingdom of God. And so that's why we've been looking at the kingdom, because it's important. The kingdom is in you and you are in the kingdom. And so last week we looked at characteristics and qualities of the kingdom of God, but this week we're going to be looking at the most important part of the kingdom of God. Based on Romans chapter 14, verse 17, it says that the kingdom of God is not meat and drink, but it is righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. And so when we looked at what the kingdom of God consists of, we saw it was righteousness, first and foremost, to be in the kingdom, to get into the kingdom of God, you have to be in right standing with God through his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. In other words, Jesus is the only way, no other way. And then secondly, when you're in the kingdom, you've been made the righteousness of God, then you have peace. You have the peace of God. The peace of God comes to reign and rule in your life. You don't only have the peace of God, but you have peace with God and you have the peace of God. And so that's so important. The, today, the world, and uh, about a month or so ago, maybe longer, um, we had Brother Festus visiting us from the Czech Republic, and he talked about peace. The fact that, so, that everybody's looking for peace. And you know, this is what's so interesting. Everyone is looking for peace, but they're doing the exact opposite of what's required to get pe get pre get peace. And you know so let's look at that. How do I get peace? You get peace, you get the peace of God which is impervious to the circumstances and situations around you through being in right standing with God. And that's how you get the peace of God because at that point you've made peace with God through his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. And then as a result of uh, righteousness, you have peace. And as a result of peace, you have joy. You know, when you have peace, you're happy. You, you, there's, there's joy. The Bible talks about the wells of salvation filled with the, the joy that, ha that comes from wells of the wells of salvation. So, so joy comes as a result of peace. Now, uh, last week we also looked at the characteristics and qualities of the kingdom of God and continuing on uh, about the characteristics, the most important and integral part um, of the kingdom of God is the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is the executor of the kingdom of God. He enforces, he brings to pass the desires of the Lord Jesus Christ, the will of God. He's the one. He's the one that's here on earth today. And so without him, you are not in the kingdom. Without him, you are not functioning and you cannot function in the kingdom of God. So let's look at what the word of God says concerning the Holy Spirit, since he is the integral part of the kingdom of God. Because when we look at Romans chapter 14, verse 17, it makes it very clear that it's not in the eating, it's not in the drinking, but it's in righteousness, peace, and joy. And where is it located? In the Holy Spirit. Jesus also made the statement, he said, the kingdom of God doesn't come with observation saying, look, it's here or look, it's there. No, he says, it's the, the kingdom of God, it's within you. When you make Jesus Lord of your life, the kingdom of God comes and dwells and lives within you. So let's talk a little bit about the Holy Spirit, seeing that he is the executor of the kingdom of God. He executes the kingdom of God on behalf of the king. 
and the king that we're talking about is Jesus. He executes the kingdom of God on behalf of the king who is risen from the dead and seated at the right hand of the father. Jesus made a statement in Luke chapter 12, verse 32. He says, it is the father's pleasure to give you the kingdom. He says to fear not little flock, for it is your father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. And then we, as we look in more into the word, we see that the word of God tells us, and it, it, it really, the word of God reveals the Holy Spirit's role in executing, how he executes the kingdom of God. So let's, let's talk about it for a little bit. First and foremost, for you to be born again, the Bible says that conviction has to take place. You have to have experienced the convicting power or the convicting work of the Holy Spirit. The Bible tells us in the book of John that he is the one that convicts us. So for you to be born again, the first thing that has to happen is the Holy Spirit convicts us. But what does he have? What does he use to convict us? And this is one of the things that's so important for us to understand as believers. When we're ministering to people, when we're sharing our testimonies with people, when we're leading someone to the Lord, when we're directing someone in the path of righteousness, which, is, which comes through Jesus Christ, it's so important. The first thing is repentance. And that's something we don't hear too much about in these days. You have to repent. You have to turn around. You have to acknowledge that, yes, you are a sinner. You have to know that you have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Romans 3.23 says, for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. We've all sinned. We've all missed it. And it has happened because of Adam. Adam sinned. And guess what? It passed on to us. It's in the blood. That's why the blood of Jesus is so important. Adam's sin caused all of us to die. But the blood of Jesus, it causes all of us who accept him, who believe the word, it causes us to live. And so the first thing is we have to repent. Who, who, who brings us and takes us to that place of conviction so we can repent? It's the Holy Spirit. But this is so important. The Holy Spirit cannot convict unless the word has been spoken, unless there's an acknowledgement of repentance is necessary. Remember, one of the things, when Jesus started his ministry, what did he say? He said, repent, for the kingdom of God is at hand. So repentance is important. And when you hear about repentance, it gives the Holy Spirit something to work with. It gives him something to work with to produce conviction. That's how he works. He takes the word that's spoken, the word that we speak, the word of God, and he uses that to bring change in our lives. Not just conviction, but also healing, deliverance, whatever we need. It takes the spoken word, the rhema, the revealing, the revelation of the word is what the Holy Spirit will use to bring to pass change in our lives. So the first thing the Holy Spirit does is he convicts. After he convicts, because the word of the kingdom, because the kingdom, the gospel of the kingdom has been preached, he convicts. When he convicts, we receive his eternal life. When you receive his eternal life, then the next thing he does is he baptizes you. The word of God says that we are baptized into one body. That's found in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 13. Listen to what it says. For by one spirit... Are we all baptized into one body, whether we be Jews or Gentiles, whether we be bond or free, and have been all made to drink into one spirit? So the Holy Spirit, what he does after we repent it is he baptizes us, he brings us in, he submerges us into the kingdom of God. And then what else does he do? The next thing he does is, according in, in Acts chapter 2, verse 4, he fills us with the Holy Spirit. So he, what he does is he submerges us in to the kingdom, and then he fills us. So we're in and we're filled. We have the kingdom of God all around us, in us. So he starts first by putting us in, and then what he does is he fills us. 
in Acts 2, 4, it says, And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and spoke with tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. And then we have some other scriptures in the book of Titus chapter 3, uh, verse 5, and, and we read, I just read 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 13, that we're baptized into one body. In Titus chapter 3, verse 5, it talks about the washing and it talks about the, re, the regeneration and the renewing of the Holy Spirit. And so that's the work of the Holy Spirit. So after he does all of that, then he fills us. And then after he does that, the word of God tells us in Romans chapter 8, verse 16, it says, likewise, the Spirit also helpeth our infirmities, for we know not what we should pray for as we ought, but the Spirit himself you know what i'm sorry i'm reading the wrong scripture romans 8 16 i thought it sounded strange romans 8 16 says the spirit himself beareth witness with our spirit that we are the children of god so after he baptizes us in the holy spirit then what he does is he confirms he acknowledges he bears witness with our spirit it's like going on a, like you're testifying um, you go to court, you testify on behalf of someone. Well, the Holy Spirit, he testifies, he confirms, he bears witness with our spirits that we are the sons of God, that we are children of God. So after he saves us, after he, he baptizes us, he fills us. And then after he fills us, what he does is he confirms to us. He bears witness, not with our heads. You know, a lot of times we try and figure it out. It's not, God is not a, a big head. God is a spirit. The Bible says he's a spirit and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. You do not deal with God with your head. You deal with God out of your spirit. And so the Holy Spirit in our spirits bears witness with our spirits that we are sons of God. In other words, what he says is, okay, Adele, you are a child of God. You've been born of the Spirit of God. You're a son, you're, you're a daughter of God. That's what the Holy Spirit does. So then after he does that, after he confirms to us that we are born again, then the next thing he does is the Word of God tells us in Romans 8, 26, is what, which is what I was reading before. He says in Romans 8, 26, likewise the Spirit also helps our infirmities, for we know not what we should pray for as we ought. But the Spirit himself maketh intercession for us with groanings, which cannot be uttered. And he that searcheth the hearts knoweth what is the mind of the Spirit, because he maketh intercession for the saints according to the will of God. So it tells us in Romans 8, 26, it says, Likewise, in addition, the Holy Spirit, he helps our infirmities. And that word infirmities is our weaknesses. And what is he talking about? The Spirit helps our weaknesses for we know not what we should pray for as we ought. So in other words, the weakness is that we don't know how to fully pray as we ought to pray about particular situations in our lives. So the Holy Spirit, he comes and he helps us to pray accurately. He helps us to pray perfectly. So let's go back. He submerges us into the kingdom. He fills us with himself. He confirms to us he bears witness he confirms he lets us know he gives us the assurance that we are sons and daughters of God and then in addition what he does is he helps us to pray perfectly can anyone pray perfectly yes if you are born again and you are filled with the spirit you are filled according to Acts chapter 2 verse 4 with the evidence then what happens is you're now able to pray perfectly. You're now able to pray effectively. Because, you know, you might be, you're facing a situation and you're seeing it only from the standpoint of your sight, your vision, your mind. But the Holy Spirit, he sees everything. And so what he does is we would pray for it in our understanding according to what we see. We would even sometimes even try and say what, tell, pray and tell him what we think the solution should be. But listen, God is greater. The Holy Spirit is bigger. He is the kingdom. The, he is the kingdom and the kingdom that dwells within you. And he will bear witness. He will confirm to you. He'll help you to pray perfectly. So this is what I'm saying to you this morning. 
If the only way that you pray is with English words, you're missing the benefits, you're missing the power of praying perfectly. And that's why you might also too not be fully happy with the results you get because you're limiting everything to, to your sight. But the Holy Spirit, He knows the hearts of man. He knows the end better than you know the beginning. He knows everything. He is God. He's infinite. He's omnipotent. He's omniscient. He's everywhere. So He knows what you need in every area of your life. And not only that, but the Bible says that he perfects those things that concern us. So we need the Holy Spirit. We need to be in the kingdom. We need him to help us to pray perfectly. And so again, Romans 8, 26, the Holy Spirit, he helps our infirmities. And that word infirmities is our weaknesses because we don't know what we should pray for as we ought to pray for it. But it says the spirit himself, he makes intercessions for us with groanings, which cannot be uttered. And he that searches, he that searcheth the hearts, he searches all the hearts. He knows what is the mind of the spirit because he makes intercession for the saints according to the will of God. So that is so important. Now let's keep going. He gives us power, the Holy Spirit. He gives us power to share our testimony and to preach Christ. He gives us power to lead people to the Lord. He gives us power to preach the gospel and the scriptures for that. Romans chapter 15, verse 19, Paul says, through mighty signs and wonders by the power of the Spirit of God, so that from Jerusalem and round about unto Illyricum, I have fully preached the gospel of Christ. So Paul says, through mighty signs and wonders, by what? The power of the Spirit of God, the Holy Spirit. He's the powerhouse. He's the source of power. That's what gave Paul the ability to preach the gospel all in that area. That's what gave Paul the ability to take the gospel wherever he went. So it's important. And then in Acts chapter 1, verse 8, he says, but you shall receive power. We need power. When we're sharing our testimony, you need to have power. The power helps us to share our testimony. The power not only helps us share our testimony, the power also confirms the kingdom, the gospel of the kingdom. So the word of God says in Acts chapter 1, verse 8, but you shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you and you shall be witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem and all Judea and in Samaria and unto the uttermost part of the earth. So you, we have the power so that we can be witnesses. It says you shall be witnesses so that we can be witnesses of the resurrection power of the Lord Jesus Christ. So here again, the Holy Spirit, he's the one, he gives us power to be able to preach the gospel. He gives us power to be witnesses of the Lord Jesus Christ. So let's keep going. So let's go back. We see he baptizes us in. He then fills us, right? Then what he does is he, he gives us power. Then he confirms to us, well, he confirms to us that we are children of God. He gives us power. He helps us to pray perfectly. And let's keep going. He gives us the ability to share our testimony in power and in demonstration, the same way Paul did, the same way the other um, uh, apostles, the same way other believers have done throughout history. Now, let's keep going. The word of God also tells us, in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 10, what does he do? The Holy Spirit, he reveals, and I put it this way, he reveals ancient secrets and mysteries, things that have been hidden before the foundations of the world. He reveals to us. The Word of God tells us in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 10, but God had revealed them unto us by his Spirit. Why? How? How? For the Spirit searches all things, 
Yes, yea, the deep things of God. So the Holy Spirit, this is what he does. This is amazing. The Holy Spirit, he searches, he knows the things of God. The Word of God says that he searches all things. Yes, he searches the deep things of God. And what does he do? He reveals them to us. In addition, in Jeremiah 33, verse 3, he says, Call unto me, and I'll answer you, and I'll show you great and mighty things which you don't know. Many people are walking around this earth today, this planet today, without purpose. Then we have Jeremiah 33, verse 3. It says, Call unto me, and I will answer thee, and show thee great and mighty things which thou knowest not. So if you call out to God, if you seek God, he'll show you great and mighty things which you have no idea about. And that's why it's so important that you don't lock and block, and, and, and block yourself, put yourself in a box. Because God is not in a box. He goes outside of our boxes, and he's much bigger than even outside of the box that we create and we put him in. You know, if you call out to him, many of you are just living life, not fulfilling your passion, not fulfilling your desire. That's, that's, you're, it's, you're, it's like as if you're a walking zombie, no life. No life because you're not pursuing the passion of what God has placed within you. Listen, call out to him. He'll answer you and he'll show you and give you clarity of what his purpose and his plan is for your life. He'll even open up the doors for you. That's what he does. That's what the Holy Spirit does. He opens up doors for you that no man can shut. Whether they like you or not, they cannot shut the door when he opens up a door. So I'm encouraging you today to call out to him. He'll answer you. He's never failed. He did it with me and he's done it with many other millions, billions of people that have called out to him. Anyone that calls out to, out to him, he'll answer you and he'll show you his plan. He'll show you your purpose. He'll show you your destiny. And you know what? This is so wonderful about what's so wonderful about it is that it's bigger than you. And the thing about it is when you, you start to walk in and enter into his plan for your life, you find that the joy that you have within you that's a result of the kingdom, it just bubbles up even more. You're filled, you're filled and overflowing. And so I encourage you. So the Holy Spirit, he submerges us, he baptizes us into the kingdom, submerges us into the kingdom. He then fills us. He reveals the Father to us. He um, shows us the things that we don't know, the ancient secrets and mysteries. He then also confirms to us that we're children of God. Um, he bears, the Bible says, he bears witness with our spirits. He gives us power. We find that in Acts. Power to live this life. Listen, you need power to live this life. This world is it's fading, it's passing away, changes. You can't keep up with it. You can't even keep up with technology. It's, it, it's always changing. But when you have the power of God in you, then you have the ability to live. You have the ability to live not reacting to life, but being proactive, creating life. And so that's why I encourage you to, to call out to him, seek him. Then... He gives us the ability to think like God. The Word of God tells us in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 16, For who had known the mind of the Lord, that he may instruct him, but we have the mind of Christ. Once you start thinking like God, nothing becomes impossible for you, because nothing is impossible for him. You think the way he thinks, you're, you start to act like him, where nothing becomes impossible for you. Let's keep going. We're running out of time. So he gives us the ability to think, to think like God, but he also gives us gifts and callings. He places his, his power and his anointing upon us as directed by the Lord to bring his, uh, uh, the plans and the purposes he has for our life, to bring them uh, to pass. He gives us faith. He gives us the faith of God, which means that nothing is impossible all things are possible. The Bible tells us in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 13, it talks about us having the same faith. And so he gives us the faith of God. The word of God tells us that he reveals the Father to us. The Bible tells us in Ephesians 3, 16, it says that he strengthens us 
on the inside. He gives us joy and peace. Joy and peace comes from him. He separates us from the world. In other words, we get a godly, heavenly perspective of living life. And that's power. To get his perspective of how to live life, it creates power in your life. The Bible tells us in 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 7, he says, For God has not given us the spirit of fear, but of power, love, and a sound mind. The Holy Spirit is power. He's given us the spirit of power, love, and a sound mind. So you can have a sound mind today. You can walk in love. You can. He gives us the ability to love sincerely. That's in 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 22. We can love sincerely because of him. He's jealous over us. I like that. Everything the Holy Spirit touches and everything he's involved in, he brings life to it. He makes alive everything he touches. First Peter chapter 3, verse, uh, 20, verse 18, it makes reference to that. Now, you see all of those things that I listed that he does? How can you live without him? How can you not want him? How could you not desire and hunger for him? Jesus needed him just as much as we do. When he walked the earth, he needed, as a matter of fact, Jesus did not do anything until the Bible tells us the Holy Spirit descended upon him in the form of a dove. Jesus didn't do anything until he was baptized in water and the Holy Spirit came upon him. It's the same with us. We are unable, incapable of producing the power that he will generate in our lives. We cannot do it without him. We need him. If Jesus needed him and we can see that he did, how much more do we need him? He is the executor of the kingdom. He's the one that executes the father's will, the kingdom, the, the, the kingdom, the king's desire and the king's will. He's the one that executes it in this earth. So what do we need to do? We have to learn to submit to him. We have to learn to yield to him. Because I'll tell you this, he produces lots of spiritual activity. Lots of fascinating, fantastic spiritual activity around us. And so today I'm telling you to lean, yield to him, lean on him. The Bible says to trust him with all your heart. Don't lean to your understanding. Don't trust your understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him and he will direct your path. You need him. You need his power. You need him in your life today and every day. God bless you. Have a wonderful week. Don't forget, you're dependent upon him. Your life comes from him. Have a wonderful week. God bless you.